good morning, everybody. I see you weren't distracted into attending the session next door. The 33rd meeting of the working group of Eurocash Communication. So, but it sounds very interesting. Money talks. Yeah, yeah, money, money talks. We had, uh, we had a couple of great, great uh, introductory talks. Victor talking about organizations who have already taken the move to adopt, to join the DevOps movement. And Chris talking about how to get organizations to take the step to adopt the principles. And I'm going to be talking about things which I think could apply to both kind of organizations. Uh, I just changed the presentation at the last minute because um, of something that uh, you, my friend, mentioned. So I, I thought I'd start off with this. <laughs> That's a broken carrier. things have changed, how things have changed. It wasn't that long ago. Does anybody know who this lady is? Yes. Oh, you do? Yes. Margaret? I have to. I have to. I'm a conference organizer. Right. So, you, so you've, you've come across her before? Yes. Right. Does anybody know what she did, apart from you? Yeah, she was, she was the lead software engineer for the Apollo project. So, funnily, Chris mentioned Apollo 13. She was responsible for Apollo 11 and wrote the code that took, took the flight there and landed and back. And her decision to create a very robust software architecture prevented a terrible accident just three minutes before the landing because she made some, made some solid architectural changes. How many of you would say, I'm a software engineer? She invented the term software engineer. So it's a, it's a bit, of, bit of history for you. Um, originally, I was asked to present a talk for 40 minutes, but due to one of our speakers not being able to attend, we had an extra 10 minutes. So I th I added this, I thought this is a bit of historical perspective to share with you. And I started, started thinking about other, other historical figures. Anybody know this guy? Professor Manny Lehman, he invented, a computer, ac academic, a computer scientist, he invented, the, came up with the laws of, um, of software evolution which I think uh, it was quite a while ago, he's, he's dead now. I think he, he died about 10 years. I am increasingly talking about people who have died. <laughs> it's a fact of life. The first, first law, I think, very significant, once you introduce software into use, it is continuously changed, otherwise it becomes out of date because the business needs new functionality, so you have to change software. So that's one of the this is first law. The second law is when you actually change software, the quality has a tendency to degrade unless you make lots of effort to keep the quality at a high level. He also has six other laws. You can find them easily enough, but I, I think it's good to reflect on these, these very fundamental principles, particularly these first two. You have to change software to keep it up to date, and you have to put a lot of effort in to keep, it, keep the complexity under control. This guy, <coughs> also dead. Dijkstra. Etzge Wiebe Dijkstra also an academic. He was the guy that came up with the, one of the major concepts of structured programming. Uh, the, uh, the dangers of using a go-to statement. 
and he did an awful lot of thought about uh, how to program well and won the Turing Award. And he, he came up with some great quotes. This is one of my favorite quotes of his. Computing's core challenge is how not to make a mess of it. And all of his writings, he, they, he called them his EWDs, the, his <coughs> the initials from his name. And somebody has taken the, taken the trouble to, uh, to di digitize them, and you'll find them on the link. He was, uh, he was born in the Netherlands, but did lots of his work in, uh, in the United States. And it's wonderful, wonderful reading, all these um, very clever man, all these writings. So take, yeah, like, I can t recommend you to take a look at that, as possibly his, the lecture he, get, he, he gave when receiving the Turing Prize in, in 72. This is almost all of the last paragraph. He said, we shall do a much better programming job provided that we approach the task with a full appreciation of its tremendous difficulty. Programming is really difficult. It is not trivial. trivial. Provided, we, provided we stick to simple and elegant languages. Provided, and I think this is very, very important, we respect, respect the intrinsic limitations of the human mind and approach a task as a very humble programmer. I thought, really great, uh, great stuff, this. He's not dead yet. He's um, Martin Loyan, professor in the Netherlands. Uh, I've learned an awful lot from him. He says, I'd certainly like to share this with you. The way you approach IT, the way you organize IT, depends on two things. The characteristics of the systems that you're managing and developing and maintaining because, I would say, obviously, you'll manage an SAP system, which is the backbone of your organization, in a different way <coughs> than you'd manage an app on a smartphone. Different characteristics. They deserve a different way of managing IT. But it also depends on the characteristics of the organization that you, that you work for, the organization that uses and develops and manages and maintains the systems. So your way of working will depend on both the systems and the organization. And there's lots of, lots of, lots of cultural aspects in, in there. If you work for an organization that's very strict on <coughs> procedures because it's a highly regulated industry like the, the healthcare industry or the financial services industry, then you'll be more inclined to adhere to strict processes within IT than when you're working for a wild dynamic marketing company. So it depends. When, and it was 14 years ago yesterday, the 11th of May 19, as 2001, when he retired from his post at the Delft University in the Netherlands, another academic, Professor Theo Bemelmans, um, spoke at the, um, at the retirement ceremony. And he spoke words which I, I can still hear him, hear him saying them today. He said, information systems have crossed the boundaries of human comprehension. That really made a big impression on me at the time, and I, I think it's still true. I think even systems have become even more complicated. Really, you know, we're talking about extremely complicated, and how do you deal, how do you deal with this stuff? So I'd say, if then else, the predictability, that is so 20th century, from now on, it's if then maybe. We're dealing with systems of which we can't predict how they're going to react. So we have to think increasingly more about resilient systems rather than reliable systems, because you can't guarantee the reliability of individual components. So you th have to think about how do we guarantee the, how do we make systems resilient? So when, when one component fails, you can either repair it quickly or fall back to another component. So I think this is a sort of a paradigm for, for our, our century. Um, I call myself the IT paradigmologist. I hope I'm the first IT paradigmologist you've ever encountered, because I, I came up with the name myself. And that, as you can see from what I call my visual CV, I started off as a programmer 
at 100% happiness. And then I got, um, you, you mentioned the Peter Principle. Um, I, Mark, you're such a great programmer, why don't you become a manager? So I got seduced into taking on management responsibilities and you can see what happened to my happiness. But I, and I, I think this was, the, <coughs> this was the most difficult point in my career, retiring from a, a, a management a director's role with status, and that kind of stuff, and doing something that, that I really liked, because I'm a content guy. I like thinking about things, which is really what an IT paradigmologist does. A paradigm is a model, is a pair of glasses, a way of looking at the world, and I study how people look at the IT world, how things are changing. And um, I'm self-employed, I'm associated with, with lots of companies. Today, I'm representing the ASL BSL Foundation, and I'll be referencing part of their work, which I, I think might be an addition to the kind of, kind of things that you're thinking about. I, it, this gets me around the world, sharing perspectives with people, and you, you think with, with our first visit to Tallinn last year, in December, the temperatures were very similar. There was just a minus sign in front of the, the temperature. That was the only, the only difference. You'd think talking to communities around the world would, would give me a lot of knowledge, but... Oh yeah, and by the way, last time, when I, and this has been referenced several times now, when in Estonia, No reaction is not always a bad reaction. <laughs> Don't even think about cancelling lunch, so I'll have to respect that. And there's more on the, on the link down the bottom. You, so you'd think talking to, to IT communities around the world that I, I would have lots of knowledge, but I, I really, conferences like this, I feel like an, an imposter. The great IT pretender. Because you're the guys who actually do the stuff. I used to be a programmer. By the way, this is a philosophical question, I think. Can you be an ex-programmer? Now, I think you can be an ex-bus driver, but if you've ever been a programmer, you're a programmer for life. So I, but I, you know, but e even so, I haven't programmed for 20 years, or more probably. So I'm talking about this from the outside. And I think that's, that's possibly what I can add to this conference, the power of perspective. Because where, as you here, possibly see two birds, if you look at this from a slightly different perspective, you can see something else. And you, you, Chris talked about monitoring and, and um, the, the axes, labeling of axes is crucial. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to add a couple of couple of different perspectives and some, uh, some metaphors that you might find useful. You may be familiar with the, with the English saying, uh, based on the show business world, it ain't over until the fat lady sings. Referring to opera, where often at the end of an opera, a lady, often a fat lady to, with a fat voice, sings and then it's done. I've stolen this to apply it to the service industry. Service ain't over until value is realized at the end of the chain. So translating that to the IT world, until the users have actually got value out of the investments that you've contributed to, service hasn't happened. So I'd like to, I'd like to extend your scope, possibly, to the, to the end of the value chain and take a slightly different perspective on things thinking about service, thinking about how we've moved on from the industrial revolution, how we live in a service economy. 13, about one and a half years ago now, 13 people came together, mainly from the IT service management industry, and got thinking about the concept of service. Because we think we're not talking about service in a very, in a very effective way, so we want to come up with a better kind of terminology. And just to give you a, a very high-level overview of something that you might like to look into, we talk about service in terms of a provider and a consumer of service in a certain environment. 
both provider and consumer have, as organizations, have intent. They want to realize something. They have principles and plans. <laughs> and they have resources that they can use to realize their, their goals. There is some kind of relationship before you start on service. For instance, Vitor, if I were to offer to cut your hair, which looked wonderful, you know, what kind of a base we met each other last night. We have a certain kind of relate, we have built up a very limited relationship with each other. Whether that relationship would allow you to engage me to cut your hair is another question. But so there is a kind of relationship. Then we move on into an engagement. I have an offering. I say, I, I, I can cut hair. This is the, my hair cutting menu. Do you want a haircut? We could make a sort of service offering. And then you have an agreement. And then the actual service act happens. And you'll notice that I'm no longer talking about service as a vague concept, but service offering, service agreement, service act pinning it down to more concrete terms, in which you have to sit still when I'm cutting your hair. So you are really participating in the process of service. And if after the haircut has happened, which in our terms we call the output, if you complain and you say it's much too short, I think I would have the right to say, couldn't you have told me that earlier? during the service act, because then we, because we're dancing together, we're collaborating, <coughs> and I, you enable me to help you. So it's really, it's close collaboration. It's one of the central themes in, in, in how I look at the world. The haircut is one thing, that's output, but what do you want to achieve with a haircut? Outcome. If you want to get some compliments from your family and friends, then that's the outcome. If I, as a hairdresser, when you engage me, if I know what you want to achieve with your haircut, then that'll help me to provide better service. We are hoping that these, this kind of terminology, and we've, um, because only then, that's when the fat lady sings. You get the value out of it. We've gone into this in a lot more detail. If you're interested, take a look at our, our site, thetakingserviceforward.org. It's a Creative Commons open, uh, open initiative. Lots, lots of great discussions on LinkedIn if you're interested. So that's, that's one thing to share with you. Another thing is reflecting on, um, just talked about the Industrial Revolution. If you look at the way, I call them management paradigms, and I've, I've stolen this, this work from Dave Snowden. People familiar with Dave Snowden? The Kneffin framework. Kneffin, anybody? Look it up. When I learned about the... I'll, I'll give, you, give you the reference shortly. It's a difficult spelling as well. Uh, when I learned about the Kniffin framework, I think about three years ago, I thought that was really one of the most fundamental things I've come across. Dave Snowden has... In, he's given many talks, and you'll find this one referenced down the bottom. He talks about how when you're talking about very simple, predictable kind of situations, scientific management in which you dictate what is going to happen works well. But when things get more complicated and you realize that in a holistic way things are connected to things, then you need a different way of thinking. And systems thinking is a great way of approaching more complicated situations. But they're still predictable. So we have simple systems, complicated systems, which you manage. Scientific management suited to mass production. Systems thinking more to mass customization. But when you move on into a world which is not ordered, but complex, which is the next stage, and I th think that's, that's the world we're in at the moment, in which if then maybe things aren't predictable, then you need a different way of looking at the world. And Snowden has come up with, um, with a, a paradigm, a way of looking at the world, which he calls his Kniffin framework. It's, it's a Welsh word. You'll find it easily enough. And there's a great introductory 
a YouTube video, eight minutes, he'll give you the basics. But he really says on the right-hand side, if the world is, is ordered, it could be obvious or complicated, but it's still predictable. <coughs> but if it's complex, not predictable or chaotic, that deserves a different kind of approach. You can't dictate up front. If you're faced with a complex situation, you can't make a plan up front in detail how things are going to happen. You have to experiment. So he says you should probe, sense, and respond. You should probe, you should do an experiment, see if it works. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't work, do less of it and control the damage. So you probe, you sense, and you respond appropriately. It really is an eye-opener. I'm just giving you these things as, as, as just part of the introduction to set the scene. Really is um, uh, radical stuff. Now, this, uh, this Kill DevOps title that I gave the, uh, gave the talk, about a year ago, I started developing this talk with uh, Dave Van Herpen on the, on the right-hand side. And this was the first, this was our, the discussion about the content. As you can see, this, is, this makes sense, doesn't it? All these, all these notes. This is when it started off. And um, I sort of wonder what kind of associations you're going to have with Kill DevOps and whether I should be hiding, hiding behind the, uh, the furniture here. I intend it in a, I think, in a slightly different way. I was thinking about kill about DevOps, <coughs> and I came across the analogy with Zen Buddhism. Funnily enough, Zen Buddhism and De DevOps, because in um, in Zen Buddhism they have the concept of what they call a koan, K-O-A-N. It's the English trans Western translation. A koan is a um, is a saying, is a puzzle to get you thinking about things. One of the more famous koans is, what is the sound of one-handed clapping? Gets you thinking about things. Another koan is, and this is about the monk on the road to enlightenment and truth, searching for the Buddha. The saying is, if you come across the Buddha on the road, kill him. And the meaning behind that is, if as a monk on the road to enlightenment and awakening, if you think you found the Buddha, you haven't. You will never find the Buddha. It's a continual process of searching. So you have to kill the, uh, the illusion of the Buddha, of DevOps. So if you think you're there, you're not. Keep learning. Keep searching, keep searching. So it's a continual, continual process. So that's the, and I've done a little bit of write, <coughs> writing about that on the All Things ITSM blog, my little DevOps, uh, Kill DevOps piece, if you'd like to learn more about that. When Dave and I, we often do this, this talk together, when, when we talk about, uh, about DevOps, we talk about behavior. And I, I refer back to the good old days when IT departments were very self-contained. You had everything under control. You had people, men and women, in white lab coats. And they understood everything. Hardware, software, data, programming, operations. They you know, really understood the whole lot. Whereas nowadays, we're organized in silos with the inevitable technical standardization and specialization, you end up speci being specialized in silos. And I'm <coughs> not sure whether you can break down the silos because you do need the specialisms but you can certainly learn to communicate better. So thinking in terms of multidisciplinary collaboration, lots of people who put the various jigsaw pieces in, um, in place. This is Dave's favorite paradigm when talking about behavior. This is a traffic, uh, traffic junction in the north of the Netherlands where they had a number of fatal accidents in the past. And what they did to, to reduce the number of accidents was they removed all the traffic lights and all the traffic signs. What happened? 
<coughs> Say, but, okay, no, no okay. People slowed down. They used their common sense. They didn't just blindly follow the rules. They looked around. So you could see fewer rules, better behavior. It's, it's, you know, sometimes we think we have to regulate things, but sometimes we have to deregulate things. So I th th think that's a great metaphor. So maybe fewer procedures and more responsibility to, uh, to people doing it. We, we talk about the evolution of multidisciplinary service flow. This is Dave's term, and I, I, I love that. Service flow. And we use this, one of my favorite paradigms, it took, it took me about 30 years to draw this diagram. I don't know why it took me so long, but... Representing the biz three major disciplines, the business, application development, application management, and IT service management. <laughs> and you could draw a value circle with um, identifying opportunities to invest in IT, designing solutions, developing them, deploying them into production, and delivering the services to the users, and reflecting on the evolution of multidisciplinary service flow, how Agile has been used to improve the collaboration between the business and application development, with and using Scrum as one of the ways of, of doing Agile, with the... Scrum's great, but... It ends up, as you, you probably know, Scrum ends up producing potentially shippable software increments. The problem is in the word potentially, because they're not shipped yet. They're waiting on a pallet to be shipped. So it does improve how the business and development collaborate, but it hasn't got them into production yet. Another thing, any idea what this represents? Another problem in Scrum? The product owner. The product owner is a sheep with five legs, almost impossible to find. I'm talking to a couple of a couple of industry gurus about product owners and people in regular organisations as well. I get a lot of feedback that product the product owners that participate in agile activities do not represent the business's interests as well as they should. So I really think this is, a, this is a major point. Improve the quality of product ownership. Now, moving on to um, how do you improve the collaboration? Well, the next area to improve is uh, IT service management and the apps uh, area. And if you use a limited application of DevOps, it's often called DevOps Lite, just focusing on the deployment aspect, then we could talk about the... Um, the principles behind DevOps, which I'm certainly not qualified to explain, I'm just giving you a reference here to one of my Dutch colleagues who references the, the work behind this, it's not his own work, but speaks about the principles. What I would like to do is um, share some of Dave's thoughts that it's not only about, not only about Dev and Ops working together, but it's also about involving the business, the customer, Security, architecture, QA, testing, suppliers, vendors, and um, support. So think when you think DevOps, don't just think Dev and Ops, think involving the whole community. It's about the evolution of multidisciplinary collabor collaboration. So that's sort of ex expanding it. Now, up until now, absolutely no value has been realized. Value is, uh, we've only got potential value up until here. It's only realized when, when, the, <laughs> when the business, business users, actually use the systems and services. And that's my particular area of interest. The ASL BSL Foundation that I represent, we, we have a couple of frameworks. One is for, for application people, more for this side, application maintenance. The other one is guidance for, for the business, how to deal with IT, which is something we haven't come across a lot. 
So what I like to focus on, and we call that business information management, how do you actually get the value out of the systems that um, the people have invested in? Because you often come across systems which aren't you... I ask this question a lot at, at conferences. How well do you think your users actually use the systems? And more, than, more, than, more often than not, the answer is they're not using them well enough. The next question is, who's responsible for ensuring that the users use the systems well? And you, sometimes you have the phenomenon of a, a key user or a super user. Uh, I'd like to introduce the concept of a super duper user. The super duper user <coughs> is not reactive. A super user or a key user is usually reactive. Somebody in the department, senior, who knows lots about it, if you have a question, you go to him or her. The super duper user is more proactive, is looking at how are the users using the systems, advising them to use the systems better, and getting more value out of it. So what I'm trying to do is to encourage, within the business department, encourage the growth of super duper users. Now, we often talk about the business as if it were one entity. Just to give you an idea what's behind here. This is, this is the framework. I won't bore you with the details. We have a framework behind this. If you'd like a free copy of this book, the, uh, the e-book, there's a reference here. It's in, the, um, it's in the slide deck. And if you're really interested, I've got a limited number of vouchers. If you approach me after the, after the talk, I'll give you a voucher to get the whole, the whole book, the e-book, with the full guidance if you're interested in improving the business side. Yeah, take a picture if you like. Yeah. <clears throat> we often talk about the business as if it were one entity, <laughs> but the business is not the business, and this is another problem. You have the, the gap between business management, who think they know how, how business operations works, and business operations itself. So you often get the phenomenon of somebody in business management starting off the circle, getting a solution made and developed and deployed and delivered, and the user saying, how on earth could you have thought that we could use this? This just won't work. So it's the difference between the functionals and the non-functionals. And this is also an area, I think, where we need to help the business to do, adopt their role and responsibility a lot better than they often do at the moment. So that's my particular interest, getting the whole business involved in this, uh, in this area. So I'd like to talk about balanced capabilities. You, you probably, have you seen this? Steve Ball, Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, say developers, 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 developers. But it's not what the software does, it's what the users do. So at conferences, I... I have to do strange things. There aren't many chairs here, otherwise I'd make some. This was in Prague. I don't think they <laughs> understood what I was doing. But users, 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 users. I want to get our, shift our, our attention to include the business, include the users in what we do, because they're the guys who will actually get value out of this. And you could say, I use the expression, it takes two to tango, a dancing metaphor, you're dancing with the business, IT and business. Or we couldn't talk about IT supply. If you're an IT department, are you, another philosophical question, are you in the business of building cars, building IT systems? And if so, who's taking care that the drivers are competent to drive and know way, where to go? <coughs> because only then will you get the value out of the investments. So we have to increasingly, I think, not only get IT supply under control, but make sure that the business does IT demand and IT use correctly. And further than IT use, if you think about the information that comes out of the systems, are the users actually interpreting the information correctly? Are they taking the right decisions based on their interpretation? And are they therefore getting value out of it? So trying to extend the, uh, extend the chain. So we have the, um, we have the monk. 
taking a look at this wonderful paradigm of ours, <coughs> which of course you should kill. Now this is, um, this stuff is serious shit. So, but how, how important is this? I'd, I'd like to do a little quiz with you, just to get a, get a grip on the, on the economic significance of IT. If you look at the proportion spent of costs spent on the initial development of a system versus all the costs that happen after the initial deployment, including the maintenance and renovation, what would you say, what's the split between the initial, initial development and the rest of the life cycle? 2080? Spot on. And it seems to be increasing, people say. So this is, the initial development is getting less and more is spent on, on the whole thing. If we take the rest of the life cycle and we split it up into how much is spent on operations as opposed to how much on new releases, what's the, what's the percentage? <coughs> 80, 20? <laughs> 30, 70. It, it varies a lot, of course, from org it depends on the kind of system, the kind of organization. But this is a ballpark figure to play around with. It could be 50, could maybe be 25, 20, but it sort of, on average it sort of pans out towards that. 30 operations, 70 new releases. Interesting, this last one, if you look at the new releases, how much is spent on releases which actually deliver concrete direct value, functional value to the users, as opposed to releases which are more technical upgrades, which of course are valuable to the users because it extends the, the life cycle, the continuity, security. So how much do you think is spent on functional changes as opposed to technical changes? 80-20, yeah, pretty clear. 60-40, more, fortunately, more on functional changes than technical changes. This is, the, this is the whole picture. So this, and I've done this based on research from, from various sources, it gives you a sort of a, a feel of the economics, how much is spent on, uh, spent on IT. If you look at, and if you look at the benefits, absolutely no benefits spent from development. Benefits only occur when it's actually in production. If we're talking to the business about IT, how do we, you know, how do you sell this stuff to business executives, particularly senior executives? Because what are they interested in? I'm hopefully sharing this model, which I'm going to build up, which you you might you could. This is an example for a private organisation. You could make a similar model for a public organisation, but this is private. Private organisation interested in profit, revenue, and costs. Costs, operational expenditure, capital expenditure. How do you reduce your costs? If you have more efficient business processes, you'll have lower operational expenditure. If you have cheaper resources or fewer resources, you'll have less investment. We haven't talked about IT yet. If we now talk about IT, we could say if, you ha if your IT is more efficient or if you have fewer or cheaper IT resources, you will be contributing to the bottom line. And you can explain this to, you, to a senior business executive. We're lowering the costs. We're lowering the, lowering the operational costs or the capital expenditure. But now, what about revenue? You can get more revenue from higher prices or more sales, or both, but how do you achieve that? You've got to look at the whole chain of producing products, developing products, marketing them, selling them, delivering them, after service, and customer relationship management, and you can imagine that depending, sorry, depending on whether it's a, for instance, a, a new product for new customers, you have different things to do, that if your IT investment affects any of these things, these business terms, 
then you can translate it into higher prices, more sales, or both. For instance, if you have, if your IT solution has functionality that improves customer relationship management, there's a likelihood because loyal customers are prepared to uh, to pay higher prices. You can make a plausible case that your investment will improve revenue. So think about the kind of things on the IT side that you could do. You could build better functionality, you could deliver stuff quicker, or the changes you make, the investment you make, could result in, in fewer or shorter outages, making the system more reliable or getting it up and running quicker. So when you're thinking about, uh, about your investment, for instance, in DevOps, if you invest in DevOps, and if you were to increase the speed, just, I'm just using the very limited case, if you were to increase, the, um, improve the deployment process, you could talk about quicker delivery of IT, probably fewer IT outages, so more reliable systems and services, maybe cheaper, maybe not, I don't know. But even if you limit it to that, uh, you could say, right, we're doing it quicker, more reliably. That could contribute to quicker deployment of functionality that improves revenue, but it probably also, better functionality could be used to make things cheaper. If you deliver stuff quicker, that's going to reduce the cost, and certainly if your IT is more reliable, you're going to have fewer costs in the business. So this is a way of illustrating how to, how to justify an investment. And it's a great exercise to think about the investment you're making and how can you translate it into terms that a business executive will understand because for business executives, <coughs> this is hot, this is not. So don't, don't talk about the, the, the features and all technical kind of stuff. I like to illustrate this, sort of rounding off the talk now, has anybody seen the, this, this film, the, the Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, a couple of people. A couple of great, a couple of quick clips that I'd like to share with you, which I, I think really illustrate how IT people often talk about IT. <laughs> you can, you can see, you can see the. It's focusing on on the demand, on the need. And in in IT, we've got to consider what does the business actually want to get out of this. If you can address that, you can make a much better case to sell your, sell your investment. So rounding it off, we've seen, um, talked about the, uh, the, the monk on the road to enlightenment and awakening. So kill that. Talked about the adaptive service model, serve the service dominant logic behind the service economy. Kill that. Talked about the... Kin I, reluctant to say kill Kinefin. Take a look at it first and then kill it. Kill the, certainly kill the product owner. <laughs> kill the concept of demand and use and certainly kill our, kill our book. Kill it. So you're constantly, constantly on the road of experimenting, <laughs> getting value out of stuff but realising it won't last forever. But... Um, Whatever you do, don't uh, don't kill the elephant because that's much too uh, much too nice to. Uh, so, now this is where my this is where my talk would have stopped. I'd like to share two more things with you. This is more on a personal level. You noticed my um, in, in my visual CV. I talked about my happiness. I, you're familiar with the concept of a KPI, a key performance indicator, I guess. I talk about LPIs, a life performance indicator. I invented that term two weeks ago. And I've gone to the, uh, you probably recognize this, this is probably the first person I've introduced that you do recognize, the Dalai Lama. Somebody, it was an Australian journalist, came across, had an interview with the Dalai Lama, I think about 10 years ago. And um, you know, if, if you were to be able to ask the Dalai Lama one question, what would the question be? Dalai Lama, what is the meaning of life? Meaning of life, I consider the happiness and the usefulness as the purpose of our life, meaning of our life. 
the very existence of our life is surely not for trouble, not for suffering. Those two words, happiness and usefulness, they have really changed my life. I've made life decisions based on, is this going to make me happy? And is this going to make me more useful for family, friends, colleagues? If you think about that, happiness and usefulness, I find this, find this a very interesting way of um, taking decisions. So I'm very pleased to share that with you. Uh, we um, have a meet the speakers session at the end of the and the end of the conference. Unfortunately, I'll be at the airport then. So there's a, now at 12 o'clock, there's a meet the IT paradigmologist. <laughs> I think Chris, Chris is probably going to be with me at the airport at the same time. So meet, to meet Chris as well. My final message is my food, <laughs> food mantra, um, stolen from Michael Pollan. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. You'll probably live a lot longer if you do that. So with that, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I hope you enjoy lunch. Thank you for the question about service. Yeah, I, I said at the end of the talk, kill, <coughs> kill everything, but that was really metaphorical. We've we just got to be aware that the, 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 the knowledge you have at the moment is great, but it will be replaced by even better knowledge. Although we came from the IT service <coughs> management industry, the people who came together one and a half years ago to talk about service, we didn't want to talk about IT service. We wanted to talk about service in general just to establish some, uh, some principles. I, I think your, your question on, on IT service, I think if we could talk after lunch or during lunch, that would, that would probably be more, more effective for you. And expect, especially for the people who want to have lunch. Talk to you directly. Another question? What is DevOps? The, what is DevOps? Yes, the, um, if you take from a Zen Buddhist point of view, I think you should define what DevOps is not. <laughs> because once you, because it's not a team, it's not a methodology, it's not a tool, once you've discovered what it's not, then you are left with what it is. But I realize that's going to take a long time. Um, <laughs> The, one of the authors of the Phoenix Project, a book which you really should read, uh, the, 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 the three ways behind DevOps which I referenced um, comes from the Phoenix Project. Jim King, <coughs> in a recent interview by April Allen, Australian lady, he said DevOps is a mix of cultural norms and technical practices to improve the flow of software through development to operations while maintaining, possibly strengthening, the um, uh, operational quality, the security, availability, and performance. But I thought the combination of cultural norms and technical practices, I think that's, that's a pretty good, um, that comes close. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Good. Thank you. Sir,